alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidi Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma alamtana innaka anta al-alimul hakim. Wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, welcome to another session of uh, acquainting ourselves with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. This is our ninth session out of ten. Next week uh, is our final session, inshallah. And we will end uh, next week, inshallah, in the blessed month of Ramadan. So I want to wish everyone um, an early Ramadan kareem. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it a month of immense benefit um, for us and our families and for um, all of the Muslims around the world, as well as all of humanity. And inshallah ta'ala, the trials and tribulations that we're all going through um, due to the pandemic, inshallah, will be <clears throat> um, lightened upon us uh, by our Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are uh, part one. This is chapter two. This uh, chapter is called The Prophet's Perfect Qualities of Character. And we're going to start here with section 17, inshallah ta'ala. So in my translation, Ba'aisha Buli, this is page 64. Section 17 is called Compassion and Mercy. And of course, this is very important uh, section. Uh, encompasses or epitomizes the khuluq, the character or ethics of the Prophet wasallam. As I mentioned in the past, we quote the famous hadith of Rahma, um, Ar-Rahman, Irhamu man fil ard, Yarhamkum man fil sama, or Yarhamukum man fil sama. Show, um, that the most beneficent, the most compassionate, the most merciful shows mercy to those who show mercy. Show mercy to those on the earth and the one in heaven, in no anthropomorphic sense, will show you mercy. And we said that this is the hadith that children learn at five years old. This is the hadith that sets the foundation uh, for their uh, education, Islamic education. For This is the hadith that first acquaints them with the Prophet ﷺ because rahmah is a great uh, virtue that we want to cultivate. So it begins, as for compassion, Qadi Iyad rahimahumullah, he begins section 17. As for compassion, tenderness, and mercy to all creation, Allah said about him, and here he's quoting again, and the translation here says Surah Yunus 128, but this is at Tawbah. This is the very end of Surah to Tawbah, those two beautiful verses at the very end. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ And he quoted these earlier, we quoted them in the past. Um, he quoted them there for a different reason. But these verses begin, Verily there has come unto you a messenger from among yourselves. And we said, Anfusikum is also read as Anfasikum, from the, mo from the most uh, noble among you. And the latter reading is considered a uh, shath reading. It's not multiply attested, so it's not recited in prayer. Um, it's not considered authentically Qur'an because it could not be established through multiple channels, but has the strength of a hadith. And then he says, Azizun alayhi ma'anitum. So she translates, grievous to him is what you suffer. Or it grieves him that you should perish, that you should suffer. So the him here refers to the Prophet wasallam. And then it says, Harisun alaykum. Harisun alaykum anxious for you, or deeply concerned is he about you. Compassionate is he, uh, merciful to the believers. Right? So that's at Tawbah verse 128, uh, uh, a beautiful uh, ayah um, describing the, the, the character, the mercy of the Prophet Wasallam. Then Allah says, he says here, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ We only sent you as a mercy to all the worlds. And we said in previous sessions as well that this is the quintessential prophetological verse in the Qur'an. This is the equivalent of our John 3.16. Remember we said that whenever a Christian wants to make a convert um, <clears throat> very quickly, he wants to give him something like, for example, if he's on the, the BART train or the subway, something like that, 
and he wants to make some da'wah to a non-Christian, he'll quote John 3.16, which is basically uh, Christian uh, theology or Christology in a nutshell. I would say this is comparable to that, that this is a beautiful summation of the, the, the very essence of the Prophet Sallallahu And we said that Allah describes him with a noun saying rahmatan. We did not send you except as a mercy, not we did not send you except that you might show mercy. He doesn't use a verb. He describes the Prophet as rahmatan. And a noun or a mustar, an ism in Arabic, describes the very nature of that thing, that that's who he is, that he is essentially mercy. Um, Rahmatan lil alamin. What is lil alamin? There's difference of opinion as to what lil alamin is. We did not send you as uh, except as a mercy to the worlds. What is the worlds mean? Some of the mufassirin say the meaning of this is kullu ma siwa Allah, everything other than God. In other words, all of creation that the Prophet sallallahu is created but he is sent as a mercy to the rest of creation because he's the best of creation. That he's better than, and this is by consensus. He's 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 greater than the Kaaba. He's he's greater than the Loh. He's he's better than the Arsh and the Kursi. He is the best of creation. He's better than Jannah. And then the question arises: If he's better than Jannah, then what's his reward? Right? If he's better than Jannah, what's his reward? How can he be rewarded with something that is inferior to him? And of course, the answer from the ulama is. Well, he will get to Jannah, but he will be in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, he will enjoy the highest type of union with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So his, his Jannah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Jannah of Jannah is actually the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That Jannah itself is honored by having the Prophet within itself. <clears throat> so another... Uh, um, opinion is that al alami means jinn and ints, al as they are called in the Quran, the two weighty things, jinn and ints. So you think about the four elements, human beings are made of the two elements, water and, and earth, if you will. And then you have our counterpart, the jinn, wind and fire, right? So they can see us, but we can't necessarily see them, but we believe in their, in their existence. And we believe in the uh, hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he tells us about the jinn. So some uh, modern hermeneutics of the Qur'an that want to sort of um, read the Qur'an through the lens of modern science, there's a few things you can do with this, but some people take it to extreme measures and say, well, the jinn are actually uh, microbes or something like that. Um, we'll leave these uh, weird opinions of some of the modernists uh, today. And uh, say, Salak Allahu al Adim, Salak Rasulullah. Allah and His Messenger know best, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well as, well as the Prophet sallam, has described uh, the jinn in numerous uh, ahadith. And that the jinn not only have sentience, right, like all um, living things, sentience, the Latin word meaning that they feel things. They, they can sense certain things, right? So even animals have sentience. They feel pleasure, they feel pain, they have senses. But here, al-alamin means uh, the sentient as well as the sapiential beings. Sapience, which means wisdom or aql, right? So here, al-alamin, lil-alamin, according to some of the exegetes, means jinn and ints. In other words, those created entities that not only have sentience, but have sapience, they have intellect. And that the revelation, the wahi, any wahi, the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always understood through the intellect. The intellect is primary. That's why if, if, if somebody receives the Qur'an and they don't have sound intellect, they're not responsible to believe in the Qur'an because you need an intellect to understand the Quran. So the Prophet ﷺ then is the bridge, if you will, between a basic awareness of God, a basic awareness of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which many philosophers and theologians argue is something that is innate, something that is natural to the human being, any human being. Um, 
uh, using their intellect, using their mind, will come naturally to the conclusion that there is a singular creator uh, to everything. Um, so the prophet then is a bridge between this uh, this basic natural awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that every human being possesses and a deep gnosis, a deep sort of intimate knowledge or what we call ma'rifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet is a bridge between that because he brings us the revelation, that he is the means of the revelation. So in this sense, the Prophet sallallahu is rahmatin lil alameen because he's giving us the wahi, the kitab Allah. He's teaching us by example, how to have a deep, intimate ma'rifa gnosis of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we said, ma'rifa leads to mahabba, to unconditional love. And one, when one has unconditional love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then one is saved, inshallah ta'ala, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if one has mistakes in aqidah. Now we try our best to correct our aqidah, and this is something that is important and we shouldn't downplay. But ultimately, uh, we may say things, we may uh, uh, do certain practices that are actually counter uh, to uh, our tradition out of ignorance, and that's why we um, we ask, we make toba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask Allah to forgive our shortcomings. Uh, and ultimately, it is our love of Allah and his messenger uh, that will save us. There's a famous hadith of a man who, um, who was a sinner and he died. But before he died, he instructed his two sons by saying that when I die, uh, cremate my body and then climb to the highest mountaintop you can find and scatter my ashes to the wind. And his son said, uh, why would we do that? And he said, I don't want Allah to be able to uh, reconstruct my body on the Yom Al-Qiyamah uh, um, so that I won't have to stand judgment. Now, that is an incorrect belief. If you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have the power to reconstruct your body, even after it's been um, uh, incinerated and scattered to the wind, then that's kufr. That's technically uh, infidelity. Now, the hadith continues that uh, this man on the Yom Al-Qiyamah, he was reassembled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Qadir, He is omnipotent. Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over all things. So he reconstructed this man. And when he asked, and Allah knows best, this is for our own edification. Allah is not asking a question because he doesn't know something. Wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is certainly omniscient. But when he asked the man, why did you do that? Why did you instruct your sons to do that? He said, I was ashamed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave the man, even though he had this error in his, in his aqidah. So this is something that uh, it's, it's obviously important for us as Muslims to understand uh, theology at a deep level. Um, but we have to also understand that by and large, the awam, um, you know, the masses of people, this is not something that's a priority for them. And we should keep the religion quite simple. And Islam is, is, is a simple religion, not, not a, a religion for simple-minded people. There's a difference here. But Islam has a, has a basic creed, and salvation in Islam is not a difficult thing. We'll get in, more into that uh, uh, later. But the essence of our theology is al-ikhlas, and this is just a few verses long. And this is what we should teach people. And um, unless you're going to be, you know, a discursive theologian or a polemicist or something like that, or if you just simply have an interest in studying theology at a deep level, which is certainly uh, possible, um, you don't need to get into the debates of the relationship between the that of Allah, the essence of Allah, and his sifat and his attributes and, and the kalam of Allah, uncreated or created. Um, really, this, these topics don't enter, into, don't enter into the discourse of the vast, vast majority of human beings. And um, the ulama, as ulama, we should know, and as professors, we should know that, we should know that um, sometimes that we delve into these things, uh, they could cause actually more confusion amongst the people. Now, we should stick to broad-based principles. 
Qulhu Allahu Ahad, say God is one, Allahu Samad, Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad, God is independent, he did not beget nor was he begotten, meaning he's not somehow caused uh, by something, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't make an effect that's equal to him, wa Lam Yakun Lahu Kufu an Ahad, there's nothing comparable unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, <clears throat> as we said, the Prophet ﷺ then is that bridge between the basic knowledge of God, awareness of God that is innate with, within all human beings, just from the intellect, the mind, <clears throat> and a deep ma'rifa, intimate knowledge leading to mahabba, leading to unconditional love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's nurun ala nur, according to Imam al-Razi and others when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says nurun ala nur, in Ayatul Nur, chapter 24, verse 35, I believe, the meaning of this is naql and aql, right? Revelation and intellect working together. Wallahu alam. He continues here, Qadi Iyad, he says, part of his excellence is that Allah gave him two of his own names. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam two of his own names, saying, bil mu'minina ra'ufur rahim. And the ulama specify here, many of the mufassirin, they say, this part of the ayah, uh, is is khas, it's, it's for the believers, because that's what it says, rahim. but before that, the Prophet's concern, حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ What is it? لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ فِزُكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِيْتُمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ It grieves him that you should perish, deeply concerned is he about you. This is more universal, this is a amma, this is for all of humanity, this is all for jinn, for all of jinn and ins, but then بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَعُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ This is for the believers this is a special type of concern merciful and compassionate is he to the believers and these are two names of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah is ar rauf he's ar rahim now notice with allah there's definite articles he is the most compassionate he is the most merciful the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam however is a reflection of these divine names at a human level right so we should all try to emulate as it were Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his divine qualities doesn't make us divine uh, it makes us uh, um, uh, pious believers right? this is a hadith there's weakness in the hadith but the ulama quoted adorn yourselves with the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we mentioned this before in the past as well many many ulama in, in, including Imam al-Suyuti and Ibn Ajiba and Imam al-Ghazali, they've written commentaries on the asma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the, the glorious, majestic names, uh, the majestic and beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they said that with all of these names, there's a, there's a, there's a human element that we can, uh, there's not necessarily, not a human element, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, there's a uh, understanding of these names that we can appropriate into our lives at a human level. Right, so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Rahman and He is Ar-Rahim, you know, the infinitely merciful, the infinitely loving and compassionate, we can also be people of compassion, mercy, and love uh, in a limited hu limited human sense, in that in that way, mirroring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> it is related that the Prophet sallallahu said, <clears throat> none of you should come to me with anything about my companions, for I do not want to go out to you except with a clear heart. So the hadith is in uh, Abu Dawood and Al-Tirmidhi. That the Prophet wasallam he wanted us to formulate, that, sorry, he wanted him, uh, he wanted to formulate his own opinions uh, about people, right? That he didn't like this, what's known as qila wa qala, he said, she said, what we would call sort of gossip or hearsay. The Prophet Sallallahu did not want to hear things about people without going out and meeting them first and formulating his own uh, his own ideas about the person. Part of his compassion, Qadi Iyad continues, part of his compassion towards his community was that he made things easy for them. He disliked doing things, he disliked doing certain things out of the fear that they would become obligatory for them. He said, uh, if I had not been compassionate to my community, I would have commanded them to use the siwak, right, the tooth stick, the toothbrush, if you will, every time they did wudu. The hadith is in Bukhari uh, and Muslim. So what he's saying here is that the Prophet ﷺ would sometimes leave certain practices on occasion 
because he knew that if he, that if he was unwaveringly consistent with those practices, then future jurists, Muslim jurists, the, the jurists, the fuqaha, uh, would have considered them as farm, as obligatory. So he wasn't totally consistent in those practices. And this is from the mercy of the Prophet So one of the things is the, the use of the siwak or the, or the tooth stick, that he would use it quite often, but not always. Uh, another thing, Ramadan, that's, that's mentioned here by Qadi Iyad, Ramadan prayers, the tarawih, sometimes he would do those uh, prayers, perform those prayers in his house and sometimes in the masjid, that he didn't fast every single day. Uh, his dislike of entering the Kaaba itself uh, during the pilgrimage, lest it become obligatory and become a hardship for the ummah. That he would shorten the prayer, Qadi Iyad mentions, if he heard a child crying. And that's a practice that he would do to make things easier uh, for us. Aisha said, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was never given a choice between two things, but that he chose the easier of the two. Right? And this goes back to the hadith we quoted, the beautiful hadith we quoted a couple of weeks ago. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru wa bashiru wa la tu'nafiru. And we looked at some of the rhetorical structure, the parallel structure of this hadith and some other hadith as well and how they're they're in, incredibly composed beautifully and exquisitely composed um in in their syntax and their rhetorical power so this hadith the translation is something like make things easy for people and don't make them difficult and give people glad tidings and don't scare people right don't use a scare tactic give people glad tidings it doesn't mean you know not to tell people the truth and you know, there's there's certainly things that we should be concerned about. Uh, the punishment in the grave and the Yom Al-Qiyamah, right? The, the Adab Al-Qabr and the Hisab on the Yom Al-Qiyamah and, and the fear of Jahannam and things like that. That's true. Um, but generally, we should be giving people glad tidings because ultimately, uh, the the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a means of salvation for people. And salvation for, uh, for um, our understanding of salvation is that is that it never ends. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran about the denizens of paradise, about Jannah, that they will eternally abide or perpetually, probably a better translation, perpetually abide therein because nothing is nothing is intrinsically eternal. Nothing has al-qidam al-dhati except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he gives Jannah, the, which is a created thing, the quality of perpetuity or immortality. So he will also give that quality, inshallah ta'ala, to our souls in Jannah so that we will continue in perpetuity to live in Jannah by the permission uh, and will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> so he was easygoing, right? Sahalul khuluq, as his, as his companions uh, have uh, described him, easygoing. Uh, disposition. Ibn Mas'ud said, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was careful when he admonished us, fearing he would tire us. And the hadith is Muslim and Bukhari, uh, according to the translator here. Admonish means to teach or to advise or to warn, right? That he did not want to overwhelm his uh, students, the Sahaba. And this is a mark of a great teacher. A great teacher is very patient. A great teacher um, will knows how to build upon uh, um, previous lessons, um, doesn't get to the conclusion of things or to the answer of questions even. If there, if there are students in the class that are asking questions uh, that are not related completely to the topic or um, if, you know, the, the professor is, or teacher is speaking about very basic things, introductory things, and there's a student who wants to know advanced things, then the teacher knows not to answer the questions at that time. It doesn't mean that the teacher doesn't know the answer. It just means that it's not beneficial at that particular time to reveal the answer. And this is, again, part of the wisdom uh, of being a, a teacher. So the Prophet wasallam, he was very careful about about um, tiring out certain, the, the, the Sahaba um, when he was admonishing or teaching them. He would give them things and dosages, if you will, so he can digest them, think about things, and then he'd give them more. 
there's really an art form. Teaching is, is not an easy thing, and it must be done uh, very carefully. All right? And the, the Greek word, obviously, for teaching a child is pedagogy. Pais, meaning child, and ago in Greek, meaning to lead. So you're leading a child, right? Um, so it's, it's a very, very delicate process, especially if they're children, because those, those are things that children don't forget, and you're setting a strong foundation. He says here, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was riding an unruly camel, which was recalcitrant, and, and she started to hit it repeatedly. And the Prophet sallallahu said, you must have compassion. The hadith is in Bayhaqi. Right? So here he's talking about a camel, an animal. Right? Rahmatil alameen. So he is a mercy to, um, to all the world, including the, the animal kingdom. That the Prophet sallallahu said in another hadith, لا تتخذوا دواب ذهور دوابكم منابرا أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام that don't take uh, the backs of your riding beasts, whatever they are, uh, horses or camels, don't take them as being pulpits. In other words, don't just sit on your animal and start uh, you know, pontificating and giving these long sermons because that's that tires out the animal. That's that's um that's that's putting undue stress on the animal so here he's talking about uh, animal rights he censured the sahaba ones because they burnt an anthill he censured the sahaba ones because they took eggs from a mother bird and the mother bird started flapping its wings and he said return these eggs uh to the mother bird so he did not approve of of animal abuse this doesn't mean that we should all be vegans and you know, really interesting. Some um, some modern people how uh, they prioritize certain things. I mean, you know, it seems like the intention is in the right place, but then you think about the, the contradictions of some of their positions. You have people that go into you know restaurants and 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 uh, start yelling at people because they're eating eggs and saying you know this is a this is a this is a a, a life and you're. You're eating something that's alive and it had a name. But some of these people are also completely pro-abortion, uh, even in the third trimester. I mean, it's very, very strange. You know, save the chicken, save the whale, save the trees, but kill the babies. Because my body by choice, right? I have bodily autonomy. So this is, a, it's very interesting. I and mean, it's really a worship of the nafs, right? They couldn't control themselves. They, they act irresponsibly. They do things, they fornicate, and then... They get pregnant, and then they want to justify to themselves um, that uh, this is this is a, a moral thing I'm doing because it's my body and I can do whatever I want with it. But they know deep down inside that uh, there's certainly the, the conscience right, uh, is 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 bothering them, and you can you can and this is something that you can uh, see with with their testimonials. And some of them are not bothered, and you and you wonder about their humanity. Anyway. Um, so the Prophet says, Aisha here must have compassion. <clears throat> That's the end of section uh, 18, sorry, 17. It was brought to the Prophet, and sorry, this, this, this section is called Integrity, Probity, and Contracts, and Maintaining Ties of Kinship. And if, in highlights of the chapter, of the sections uh, before um, uh, the end of class next week. And I said, once uh, when a gift was brought to the Prophet Wasallam, he said, take it to the house of such and such a woman. She was a friend of Khadija. Uh, she, uh, she loved Khadija. And Aisha said, I was never jealous of any woman the way I was jealous of Khadija when I heard him mention her. If he sacrificed a sheep, he would send it to her friends. Her sister, Hala, Hala bintu Khawailid, asked for permission to enter, and he was happy to see her. A woman came to him, and he received her with kindliness, and asked after her very considerately. When she left, he said, she used to come to us when Khadija was with us, maintaining ties as a part of belief, and the hadith is in uh, Bukhari. So the Prophet Sallallahu first wife, Khadija, passed away, um, anha. she was his first disciple, she passed away in the Meccan period, and Aisha was saying that, that even as late as the Medinan period, the Prophet ﷺ would maintain uh, ties 
with uh, relatives of Khadija uh, as well as friends of Khadija. He would continue to uh, honor them um, um, and show them uh, kindness. The Prophet used to carry Umama, his granddaughter by Zainab, mm -hmm. on his shoulders. When he prostrated, he would put her down. When he stood up, he picked her up. <clears throat> so this also reminds me of the famous story where the Prophet Wasallam was standing on the pulpit and he was giving a khutbah on Jum'ah. And his very young grandson, Imam al Hussein, following his grandfather's voice, wandered into the masjid. And the Prophet ﷺ descended the minbar and picked up his grandson and hugged him and went and then reascended the, the pulpit and finished his khutbah while holding Imam al Hussein uh, in his arms. Um, this is a testament to the merciful and, and tender nature of the Prophet ﷺ. Um, with uh, with his you know not only his wives his companions not only with animals uh, but also with uh, with children and as we've spoken about in the past the Prophet sallam he continued to show good character to even his enemies that were trying to attack him and this is what was so astounding to Abu Sufyan ibn Harb who um, just before the conquest of Mecca became Muslim. And uh, he was just absolutely smitten that the, the Prophet ﷺ uh, um, continued to speak to him with respect. Um, and, and then he said to him, uh, you know, may my parents be your ransom. You, you still speak to me with respect after all these years where I've, uh, try, where I've tried to, you know, kill you and, and, um, and led, you know, these military campaigns against you and have killed many of your uh, companions in battle but the prophet وسلم, did not give up even on his uh, worst of enemies he continued to show them good character and there's a lesson in there uh, for us again this is a difficult thing to do but he is our ideal and we should try to strive for this type of perfection so the excuse of well that's the prophet and i just can't do that he's just so great he's still a human being I mean, the Prophet وسلم, he still got angry, he, he became depressed at times, and you know, when he met Wahshi, the man who killed his beloved uncle Hamza, uh, he, the Prophet وسلم, he just he 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 became very, very angry and he said, May I never see your face uh, again. I mean that's that's a human being, right? Um, and then eventually um, he welcomed Wahshi and and um, and uh, he he showed him kindness and, and and mercy as well. So using this excuse of well that's the prophet and he's perfect and he's immaculate and who am I? I'm nothing. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, is also a human being, and many of his um, many of his um, uh, reactions to certain situations are 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 very similar to what any human being do uh, initially, um, but. Uh, if we see how he uh, treats situations, um, eventually, uh, and his wisdom behind dealing with certain problems in the society, even within his own household, uh, that's certainly something that we can emulate and at, at a certain level and strive towards this uh, perfection. You're never going to hit perfection. We're not going to reach the khuluq of the Prophet وسلم, but that's not the point. We strive towards it. It's like an old football coach named Bill Walsh, um, who was the coach of the San Francisco 49ers in the 1980s when the 49ers were a dynasty. And um, he used to tell his quarterback, uh, Joe Montana, he would say to him, when you throw the ball to a receiver, aim 12 inches right in front of the numbers. And anything other than that is imperfect and you've missed the target. Now, 12 inches in front of the numbers, can you imagine that on a 40-yard pass? Because that was perfection. You aim towards perfection, um, and you're obviously going to come short, but you you might come close to it. Um, so the Prophet ﷺ is is our perfect role model, and we should try our best to emulate his character and not make excuses. And we fall short, we fall short, we make toba, but we we keep trying. Now we said, Abu Qatada said, a delegation from the Negus, that's the king of Abyssinia, Najashi, arrived and the prophet got up to serve them. His companion said, let us do it for you. 
And he said, they were generous and honored my companions. So I will do the same for them, al Haqi. So the Prophet wasallam uh, was himself uh, serving the people, right? That he was doing that himself. In a hadith of Khadija, she told him, may Allah, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may Allah bless him and grant him peace. So Khadija says to the Prophet, rejoice by Allah, Allah will never bring you grief. You maintain connections with kinsfolk. You bear all and you give help to those who are in need. You're hospitable to the guests and you help people to get what is their due. Um, and uh, this was after the, the, um, the context of this statement of Khadija is after the descent of the initial wahi um, later to Qadr in Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ, this is something else that's astonishing about the Prophet ﷺ, again, showing his humanity that he didn't know initially what had happened to him. He's Nabi al-Ummi. He doesn't have this formal education in religion. He's not familiar with Ahl al-Kitab and their beliefs necessarily. Uh, he's an unlettered prophet, and he has this experience in this cave. Um, and he is very, very sincere. Um, in thinking that maybe something bad has happened to him, maybe he's been possessed by a jinn or something uh, like that. This is a very honest reaction, and this is something that's um, pointed out. Uh, for example, this book by Leslie Hazelton, it's a very good book she wrote, non-Muslim as far as I know. She wrote on the psychology of the Prophet Wasallam, saying that this reaction shows the great sincerity of the Prophet Wasallam that a, a charlatan of some sort would not have this type of initial reaction if someone's trying to pull the wool over your eyes and claim to be a prophet when they're not. Um, they, they would come down the mountain with their chest out in the air and proclaiming that, he, that you know, I am a prophet and, uh, and you must obey me. And, but the prophet's reaction was one of distress. So he went to his wife Khadija al-Kubra, radiallahu ta'ala anha, his wife, and it was Khadija who reassured him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not humiliate you uh, by this type of demonic possession or mental illness or something. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, knows, certainly knows, that you maintain ties of kinship, you're good to the orphans, uh, that you're good to the guests, that you provide things to people who need things. But here's the thing also is that She's no expert in matters of religion. So what do they do? They go to an alim, and this is the proper method. All right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of ad dhikr Ask the people of ad dhikr here probably means revelation, revelation in general. Or the Qur'an in particular, of course the Qur'an is a revelation. But ask the people of revelation if you don't know Right? So she's not an alima, but Waraqa bin Nawfal, her cousin, a Christian scribe, he was an alim. So they go to Waraqa, and the Prophet ﷺ recounts what had happened in the cave. And Waraqa, he says, uh, this is his judgment about as to what happened to the Prophet ﷺ in the cave. Indeed, the great namus, the great nomos, nomos is the Greek word for sharia, or sacred law. The great law has come to you. Others say nomos or namus, is that, others say that namus here is actually the Arabic of penuma, which means the great spirit has come to you, the spirit of inspiration, just as it came to Musa ﷺ. Right? And of course, we have the famous prophecy of Deuteronomy 18.18 18, that a prophet will come um, from the brethren of the Israelites who will be similar to Musa alayhi salam. Deuteronomy 18, verse 18. Now, that sounds like a, a valid part of the Torah. Uh, Wallahu alam. We cannot confirm nor deny, but certainly there is a prophecy in the Torah that sounds like it finds its fulfillment uh, with the prophets of Allah alayhi salam. So that's the end of section 18. Now section 19 is called his humility. In spite of his high position and exalted rank, he was extremely humble and not in the least proud, says Qadi Iyad. 
There is proof enough of that in the fact that he was given a choice between being a king prophet and a slave prophet. And he chose to be a slave prophet. Right? The Prophet ﷺ lived in a state of self-imposed poverty. Right? He could have been a king prophet like Dawood ﷺ, Sulaiman ﷺ, huge palaces, servants. Right? But he chose to be a slave prophet. Uh, because the majority of his people, all of his people were living, actually most of his people were not, were not affluent people. And he was a man of the people, so the body of Sadna. So he lived among his people. He was a man amongst men. When he did that, Israfil said to him, Allah has been generous to you because of your humility to him. You are the master of the children of Adam on the day of rising and the first for whom the earth will open up on the day of rising and the first to intercede, Abu Nu'aim. So the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, مَنْ تَوَادَ عَلِ اللَّهِ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ تَكَبَّرَ وَدَعَهُ اللَّهِ Remember this hadith. Uh, it's a beautiful hadith uh, that is has incredibly, incredible ethical uh, import uh, that whoever humbles themselves before God, تَوَادَعَ Before God, رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ Allah will raise Whoever humbles themselves before God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise the rank. Woman takabara. And whoever takabara, right, this form five verb, the meaning patterns of form five uh, is, is to consider, it's considerative. Whoever considers oneself um, to be to be kabir, to be great, to be high and mighty. Allah Allah will debase and humiliate. And we find uh, an echo of this statement as well in the New Testament Gospels and the synoptic tradition uh, that whoever, is, whoever is, is low will be made high, whoever is uh, high will be made low, this type of thing. Have mercy, have humility with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise your rank. But if you deem yourself big and high and mighty, uh, then Allah subhanahu wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will debase and humiliate you. And we see that with people like uh, Nimrud, very interestingly. Uh, Nimrod, which according to the ulama was the first man ever to claim to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first one who ever made a claim to deity was this king of Babylon at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And according to the exit. Uh, Allah sent his servant a mosquito or a gnat or something that flew up his nose and bit him and the pain was so intense that Nim Nimrod would have his servants come into the room and, and beat him over the head with their shoes as a way of sort of dulling the pain, you know, going into sort of a, a, a daze and then the pain one day was so intense that he ordered his servants to beat him harder and harder until they beat him to death this is the end of the man who claimed to be God, right? Allah sent a tiny servant. If you look at the world today, as one of our teachers said recently in an amazing talk, that um, the king of the world today is this coronavirus, this thing that you can't even see. A servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything is, in, everything is, is in, in, in service, and a servant subservient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, that is just... Um, you know, it's, it's put us all on time out, as it were. Uh, we have to think deeply about these things, the state of the human, um, uh, the, the state of the human mind, the state of the human heart. When it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, what's happening in the world, um, what's happening with, uh, with religion, with faith. Um, um, I mean, something like this should, should, should uh, provoke deep, contemplation within ourselves as to why these things are happening and how we can improve, improve ourselves. <clears throat> and that's, you know, the Prophet ﷺ was a very, very deeply reflective person. And the ulama and the awliya and the sahaba were very deeply reflective. And they were also very um, uh, self-censuring, um, that they were constantly trying to work on their faults. They, they were not people that were satisfied with themselves and they would turn the finger inwards and if something would happen in their lives, a trial or tribulation of some sort, um, 
they they would uh, take it as a, a a a means by which they can make toba and and in, improve their character and improve uh, their relationship with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and come back into the good graces of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Of course, when things like this happen to a prophet, it's never a type of punishment. The prophets are not punished because they can't perform conscious sin. It's always a way of raising their rank. But even with believers, it could also be a means of raising our rank. Now, it could initially be a type of punishment, right? But then we recognize that and we try to rectify our behavior. And by doing that, making tawbah and making that rectification, it'll be a means, inshallah ta'ala, by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise our ranks uh, as well. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said the affair of the mu'min is always good. It's always good. Even if there's some sort of disaster or trial or tribulation, we understand why uh, things like that happen. We live in the dunya, but we try to learn from those things. And these types of things should provoke a type of toba and return. You know, toba, taba means to turn, to reorient ourselves towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So at the end of the day, everything is good for us. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I am a slave. I eat as a slave eats, and I sit as a slave sits. All right? And um, there's a story mentioned that he was sitting on his knees one time, and he was eating something, and a Jewish woman passed by him, and she started to mock him and say, look at your prophet. He, he eats like a slave. I mean, this is how he's sitting on the ground eating something. And the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Alas to be abd, am I not a slave? Right? Am I not a slave? Of course, he's a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is, um, he is a, a servant that has this beautiful tawadur, this beautiful humility with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's not doing these things out of ostentation. And that's another thing we should check our intentions when we do certain things. You know, that, um, why are we doing things? Is it, is it simply, is it simply for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or are there other things that are operating within us? So we have to really take ourselves to a task and, and be honest with ourselves. Very difficult for us to be honest with ourselves. There's a, uh, a saying of uh, Ibn Ata'illa Sikandari, a very beautiful saying that I'll mention here. It's not mentioned here by Qadi Iyad, but uh, Ibn Ata'illa, he said, an act of sin that leads to humility Right, tawadu and brokenness, intisar, right, brokenness, what Catholics would call contrition. It's a beautiful word, contrition, to be contrite is one of the, um, the prerequisites of, of toba, of repentance and Catholicism, is to feel a sense of brokenness. The word contrition means to be broken. A sin, uh, an act of sin that leads to humility and brokenness before God is better than a good act that leads to arrogance. It's better than a good act that leads to kibr, to arrogance. And there was actually a debate amongst the ulama as to which state is better, if you believe this or not. Which, which state is better? Uh, the state of a person who never sinned or the state of someone who did sin but made toba. right? Now, ultimately, they said the former because that's the that's the um, that's the, uh, the the way of the prophets that they don't sin consciously. But the fact that there was a debate on this issue is quite telling. That that um, that human beings sin by nature. Kulu bani Adam chataun, wachiru chataina tawabun. And the ulama say here, kulu bani Adam is 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 needs a nuanced meaning there that it's it's not including the the prophets. All of the children of Adam are sinners and the best of sinners. Um, uh, uh, are, are those who make tawbah, tawabun, those who reorient themselves back towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of my teachers said there are two kinds of people uh, in the world. The one who enters a room and says, salam alaikum to the people in the room. And when they don't answer him, he thinks to himself, what's wrong with these people that they're not answering my salam? That's one type of human being. Another type of human being is the person who enters into a room and says, Salaam Alaikum, and the people don't answer him. And then he thinks to himself, what is wrong with me that these people are not answering my Salaam? What did I do? Did I wrong them? What, did I break decorum of some sort? 
Uh, did I show bad adab of some sort? Right? Two kinds of people. The Prophet used to ride a donkey and would have someone ride behind him on it. He would visit the very poor and sit with the poor. Again, these very difficult things to do. You know, we, we read these things in books and, and we think, well, I, you know, how many times have I sat with the poor? And um, We should strive to do these things. He answered the invitation of the slave and sat among his companions, mixing with them. He would sit down among whichever part of the company he came to so that, you know, if you walked into a room and the prophet was there, you, you wouldn't even know which one was the prophet, you know. It's not like the, the one sitting on the throne or the pulpit or the, you know, the, 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 the fancy green cushion or something like that. He was just, he was amongst the people. He was amongst the men. He was a man among the men, uh, as I said. In a hadith written by, by Umar, the Prophet said, Do not lavish praise on me as the Christians lavish praise on the son of Maryam, alayhi wasalam. So this hadith is in Bukhari, it's mentioned by Imam Tirmidhi in the Shema'il, uh, I believe as well, that uh, don't, you know, the translation says lavish praise on me, but really flatter me in terms in which Isa alayhi salam, uh, kama, in terms of, or similar, or just as, Isa alayhi salam, uh, was flattered or given titles that he did not merit or that breached the um, parameters of acceptable theology. Because there really is no way of overpraising the Prophet wasallam, right? Praising the Prophet has, is limitless. The, the poet said, فَإِنَّ فَضْلَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ لَيْسَ لَهُ حَدْ There really is no end to the uh, to the virtue, the virtues of the Prophet ﷺ, but don't make him into more than a man, right? And this is what the, so what did the Christians do? We have to ask this question when we read this hadith. You know what did the Christians do with Isa ﷺ? Some of our brethren they say, well, you're celebrating the birthday, the Molid of the Prophet ﷺ. This is what the Christians are doing, and is that is that what he's talking about? Celebrating. Uh, a birthday, and um, I mean that. Uh, I think that's a pretty uh, weak argument. Um, the, the point here is not to make him more than what he is, right? The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, when he entered Medina and he realized that, or he was told that the Jews were fasting on Yomi Ashura, he says we should fast too, you know, um, and a day before or after, right? Um, so. Um, you know, this, this, this certainly doesn't mean, you know, that, you know, oh, you know, he's, he's imitating what the Jews are doing. And I mean, this is the prophet himself giving the command to the Muslims. We have a greater claim on Musa, alayhi salam, he said, right? Uh, the prophet sallallahu alayhi salam is by consensus greater than Isa, alayhi salam. Surat Maryam is basically a molid. It's a narrative of the birth of Isa, alayhi salam. Allah is praising the birth of Isa, alayhi salam. How much more should we praise the birth of the best of creation, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If if Musa alaihi salam's exodus from Egypt is is commemorated by the Jews, how much more should we commemorate the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or the command of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? So that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about giving the Prophet a rank or a station of some sort that that is outside the bounds of acceptable theology. So what did the Christians do with Isa alaihi salam? They made him into the literal son of God. And what does that mean? That means that they said that Isa alayhi salam, his essence, that the, that the essence of Isa alayhi salam is divine. That Isa alayhi salam, when he was a human being, is really what's known as a hypostatic union of two persons, the human Jesus of Nazareth, but also the Logos or the son of God who has an eternal who has an intrinsic pre-eternality. So they're ascribing to Isa alayhi salam a divine quality. So don't do that with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. Don't say the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam uh, has an inherent uh, divine quality that he's all hearing, he's all seeing, he's all powerful, this type of thing. This is what the Christians did with Isa alayhi salam, and this is what we're told to avoid. We're not giving any divine qualities to the Prophet 
um, everything that he has is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the ontological source of everything, period. Uh, so, this is a good place to stop, inshallah ta'ala. We are in section, the middle of section 19. Inshallah, next week uh, we'll finish, um, inshallah, I think there's 24 sections in this chapter, if I'm not mistaken. 25 sections. It'll be a bit difficult, but maybe we can manage it. So we'll see you next time, inshallah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.